Good morning. You're back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are resuming our work on S-15 um, with the Director of Elections uh, and Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, then it'll be my uh, intention to hear from Carol Dawes. And then we've got a couple other witnesses who are here with us today to respond to various parts of the bill. So uh, back to you, Will and Chris. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I'm just gonna really quickly finish up with a few other points on um, security measures. And then Chris is gonna talk a little bit about voter fraud, I believe. So just a couple additional points. Like I said, we intend to when we're, if the bill passes as, as it is now, and if we're mailing a ballot to all active registered voters for the general election, to also include on the certificate envelope, a barcode that's from the election management system from the statewide checklist that's unique to each voter. Um, I will admit that the primary purpose of that is administrative. It's for ease of processing on the clerk's ends. They can use the barcode reader, scan that barcode and immediately have that voter checked off the checklist as having received a ballot. Um, but I think it also is a security measure in the sense that if in an instance where um, the person who signed the envelope and indicated they're returning it is different than the person behind the barcode, it just at least raises a flag for the clerk um, to look into that ballot being returned. And we had a, a significant amount of that, uh, some instances of that in November, 2020. And um, the vast majority that I remember ended up being uh, household exchanges. So wife used husband's envelope or vice versa. Um, but I, like I say, it at least rise, raises the flag for the clerk to maybe follow up with that voter and, and find out what happened. Um, additionally, if in the event that um, there was some indication that ballots were being returned fraudulently from any particular address um, or from any particular person, um, we do, we obviously know the mailing address that each ballot was sent to. And so in terms of conducting an investigation, that's at least another starting point. Um, if you notice that you had a, a bunch of ballots sent back by people who didn't appear to be the voter from a certain location where those ballots were sent, that would give you a first, a first step for the Attorney General's office in investigating. Um, and finally, I just wanted to mention that the bill, um, one of the provisions I really like is the allowance and um, encouragement for the use of secure drop boxes by the towns. Um, I think we had about 175 towns that were providing them um, in November on a less formal basis. Um, we authorized them to do so to either use existing mail slots um, or to install new mail slots or drop boxes uh, this past fall and provided some funding to do so. Um, but this bill, I think, sets an appropriate sort of baseline set of security measures for those drop boxes. Um, and says that the Secretary of State's office will buy a certain number um, for towns that do choose to use them. And I think this does provide probably just the most secure and most direct way, other than handing it in to the clerk, him or herself, for voters to return their ballots. Um, convenient as well. And so <laughs> I do think that that's another um, secure option for delivery of the voted ballot back to the clerk. Um, Representative with, LeClaire has a question. Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, I got a, a couple of questions, I guess, around the, um, the certification envelope. Um, one, what constitutes a signature? It's a good question. Um, almost any marking. Would an X be considered a allowable mark? In the case that the voter is physically unable to sign, yes. Well, that was my next question. What what does happen if you have somebody who physically can't sign themselves? What 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 is the process? Typically, those folks are um, in a situation where they and Carol can can speak to this some more, I believe, but where they would be. Um, requesting the two justices of the peace deliver the ballot. And in that case, there's really specific language in the statute about a voter that's unable to sign, being able to, to use a dot or an X as long as it's witnessed 
um, by the JPs delivering the ballot. If it's not that case where a ballot's mailed out, I would um, expect them to be contacting the clerk to ask what's appropriate in that situation or a, a care provider for that person. Well, okay, so- It's interesting, from- uh, Rep. LeClaire, I'm sorry. I, I also have wanted to address for some time and have wondered whether it's appropriate to do in statute um, how and to what extent powers of attorney may be used to sign these certificate envelopes. Uh, that's a question I get almost every election cycle and okay, don't that, have a particular answer for. That, that was gonna actually be my next question, Will, was that aside from the, doing something in the presence of the, the, the justice of the peace, is there any other provision out there where if somebody has um, a, a legal guardian, um, you know, any other sort of legal oversight over somebody that they could sign for them or not? Not specifically right now, but I would not be opposed to trying to craft some language around that. I think it's a difficult needle to thread, as you probably can imagine. Um, And my answer to the question, at least, is always from my private practice experience, which seems in the distant past at this point, um, is to at least make sure that the scope of the power of attorney covers this kind of transaction. Because as you know, this power of attorney can have various scopes and be limited or not. Sure. So just one more question. For, so for clarification's sake, so if you had a ballot that got sent in and arrived and on the certification envelope, there was clearly an X written on it, would that be considered an acceptable signature? First, you would have to be assuming that you otherwise um, had the voter's name, right? That their name's printed clearly above on the certificate or in the return address that you could even identify them. Because otherwise, you'd be in a position where you just don't know who it is anyway. Right. Um, But if you do know the voter and then the signature is just an X, um, again, if I got the question from the clerk, I would, I would encourage the clerk to follow up with that voter at that point to try and contact them and ask them whether that, whatever the marking is on the certificate was intended to be and was in fact the signature. But there's, there's no um, definition or sort of minimum standard for what constitutes a signature in the statute. So I'm hearing you say that some of it could be open to the clerk's interpretation. I think, and then I think the other part right. of it could be sort of their ability to contact the voter as well. Yep. Okay, very good, thank you. Rep Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair, thank you, Will. Will, I uh, just wanna follow up on that a little bit. Um, any official voter registration, is there a signature required for that as well? On the paper forms, yes. Okay, so in that case, you'd run into the same issue, wouldn't you? I mean, if somebody can't sign, something has to happen, right? Yep. Okay. Um, and then the other question I've got is you talked about uh, a barcodes, barcodes on the mailings and uh, a barcode reader. Uh, who would be responsible? Would the town clerks be responsible for purchasing their own barcode readers? No. We, okay. our, our office would cover that cost. Okay, thanks. All right, I don't see any further questions. Oh, now I have Rep. Fave with a hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize, I logged back in, I think a second too late to hear um, what came, the reason um, Mr. Sunning was giving his explanation, but uh, may I ask one more question from my list? Um, so the on um, last week when we were speaking, Mr. Sunning, and you were unable to attend, I asked a question about um, the the scenario we heard on the radio about the middle the Middlebury students, um, and your response just made me think of that. So there was um, some allegations that the Middlebury students were scooping up unclaimed mail out ballots in large numbers and sending them back in, um, and I, I've heard that you guys didn't, you know, that claim never came. A, you know, a true to your office. So there was never any look into it. Um, and I have a question about that also, but, you know, hypothetically, h- how would you detect that information that, how would you detect that that was occurring? 
is, you know, is there a trigger system of like, wow, all these ballots were, you know, came from here, but maybe their addresses were for somewhere else? Or is there a way to detect if someone is, you know, scooping up ballots, filling them out and sending them back in? First, it's really difficult for me to speak to anything around that particular instance. As my impression was it was a single caller into a radio program that the secretary was on. And as you mentioned, um, Rep Lefebvre, I think the secretary's first response during the program was encouraging uh, that person to make a formal complaint and give us any further information or detail about what they were alleging. And we heard nothing. So um, at this point, I consider that a, a entirely um, unsubstantiated allegation. Um, and I think your question really just, just speaks to the process that we talked about before. Um, and so it's, it's, it's difficult for me to comment and react to that. I don't know what's meant by scooping up ballots. Um, so I, it's, it's all of the controls that we talked about. But if, if those ballots are coming back with signatures that appear to be of the voter that they were sent to, and there's no other reason to question them, that voter, that active voter would be checked off the checklist and the ballot would be counted. And, and I would just add. Thank you. I, I appreciate your. Sorry, I'm sorry. Nope. Sorry. Sorry, I, Mr. Winters. Sure. I, I would just add that you know if we did receive a complaint about this, we would investigate it, and and what we would do is we would reach out. First, we would you know if we had a specific address where this was alleged to have taken place, uh, we would see who is registered to vote at that address. We could reach out and contact the individuals who are registered there, ask them if they voted. Uh, we could look into who's currently a resident there, uh, see if those people are registered or if they have voted, interview witnesses. Um, there are a lot of different ways. We'd look at those envelopes, look at those signatures. Potentially, um, if we contacted a, a someone who used to live there and they said they didn't vote, and then that ballot showed up in that town clerk's office, we could take a look at those envelopes, look at the signatures, do further investigation. But we need a complaint. We need specifics in order to act on those things. Thank you. And if I may ask a follow up. So if we're talking about how we have the highest respect for integrity in our voting and you get this tip in where maybe the people, you know, for whatever reason, have their reservations of calling in, what stops the state from doing their own investigation to be able to show that we as the state uphold voter integrity? Like, hey, we heard about this. You know, we looked into it to see how true it was. Um, and this is what we found. What stops the state from doing their own instead of having somebody come in and make a complaint? Chris, do you want to handle that one? Sure, or, or? sure. I, I, I can. You know, we hear a lot, and and you all probably hear a lot of allegations that are that are thrown out there. We can't chase ghosts. Uh, we need some specifics to act on. We don't want to just start sending investigators around the state. We would refer this to the attorney general's office if we thought there was anything to it. Um, we take voter fraud really seriously. And if we hear of something serious, we will, we will go after it and we will investigate. But what we have in a case like this is we don't have an address. We have Middlebury students. We have allegations of scooping up. We have 20 ballots or 30 ballots or, or whatever it is. You know, we have the smallest elections team in the country and we need to use our resources wisely. If we get a serious complaint, we will do something about it. We have harsh penalties on the books and we will take action, uh, but we can't, we can't chase hypotheticals and, and, um, and allegations out there. Thank you. Representative LeClaire. Um, I, would, I, would just, I would just add that there's no subjective judgment of what's serious or not either, but it, it's made serious by, we need information. I honestly don't know Rep Lefebvre where I would start. I, there's like, like Secretary, Deputy Secretary said, there's no address, voter names, which ballots these were. I, there's, there's absolutely no place to even start. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I got a question, I think one for Chris and, and one for Will. Chris, the first one to kind of follow up on Samantha's question. Um, and you may not have the answer right at the tip of your tongue, but how many occasions has there been either voter fraud or election fraud that has been referred to 
the AG's office and how many of those were prosecuted, say, in the last 10 years. And if you need to get back to me on that, I'm fine. And then the other question I have is looking at this general election voted ballot envelope. I had a robust conversation with uh, the member from Burlington's, one of his more informed constituents, and he had raised the issue about um, if there have you entertained dealing with the mail out uh, ballots in a little bit different and using a remittance envelope. And I guess that they're different in that a remittance envelope is the back flap could actually contain all the information and the place to sign. And you'd have one envelope that would address all those issues. And I'm just curious to know if there's been any conversations about changing, if we're, if we're gonna continue down this path, have there been conversations about changing how we're going to do it and cutting down on envelopes and postage and maybe some of the occurrences for uh, curing? Thank you. Thanks, Representative LeClaire. I'll, I'll defer to Will on the envelope question, but as to your first question, um, I don't have exact numbers for the last 10 years, but I do know prior to the last few years, uh, every year we kind of say, can anyone remember an allegation of voter fraud in the state of Vermont that, we, that we've prosecuted? Um, or allegations, uh, complaints that we've received, not just that we've prosecuted. Um, it's, there are very, very few and far between. There was maybe a couple in the last 10 years of complaints that we'd received. We really don't get complaints of voter fraud. And you would think that if there's you know, any voter fraud happening, any widespread voter fraud especially, we'd see more complaints than that. And then I will follow up by saying last year where we had um, a lot more attentions on our elections, a lot more absentee voting, we did receive um, seven complaints of alleged double voting. And we looked into all of those and we referred them to the attorney general's office for an investigation. And we know that one was an actual uh, legitimate case of, of double voting. And we talked about that one earlier. So last year in the Vermont general election with more than 370,000 Vermonters voting, an all time record for us, we had seven complaints of alleged double voting with only one confirmed as legitimate. We had zero complaints of voter impersonation, zero complaints of voter intimidation, no unexplainable complaints of someone showing up at the polls and, has, and, and telling us that they've, they had already been checked off as having voted. Now you would think if there's a lot of stolen ballots going on out there or you know, 30 people in Middlebury sending in, not 30 people, 30 ballots in Middlebury getting sent in on behalf of, uh, of someone else, that we would have at least one complaint about someone showing up at the polls and saying, wait a minute, this shows I've already been checked off and I haven't voted. We had zero of those. We had zero complaints of stolen or damaged ballots. We had zero complaints of so-called ballot harvesting. So anecdotally speaking, we have the, the numbers from 2020, but from before that, we rarely, rarely get cases, uh, complaints of voter fraud. And if we find them to be serious, we refer them to the attorney general's office as we did last year. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. And I would just add um, to that a little more detail. As, as Chris mentioned, Rep. LeClaire, we referred seven potential incidents to the attorney general this year, of which one has resulted in potential penalties that we're gonna follow up on and figure out at what stage they're at with those penalties. Um, generally, what Chris said is true about the level of these. I also can remember, number one, for the, for the historical review and the numbers, I know that the AG's office tracks this and could, and could tell you. Um, in the cycle before this in 2018, I did refer maybe three or four off the top of my head, I'm thinking, to the AG's office. And one of those did result in um, community service being assessed for, I believe uh, it was a college student or younger person who had submitted a ballot both by mail and then voted in person. Um, but we can certainly follow up with the AG's office on the more detailed history of that. Um, to your second question, the answer is yes. Um, strongly considering the envelope design and the return method and 
and yeah, I've gotten the suggestion to limit it to one envelope from a number of different places. And when my question is, well, what do you do about the certificate and the signing and not wanting a signature on an envelope that's out in the mail? That's been exactly the suggestion is that a lot of people use a flap approach where the signature is on the inside of the flap and then it's closed down. Um, so we are considering that uh, as a potential option going forward. Like you say, just to reduce complexity and mailing costs and printing costs. Sure. Very good. Thank you. Representative Merwicki and then Rep Lefebvre, and then we'll get back to uh, witnesses. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I'm finding it interesting that we keep coming back to speculation about an incident, supposed incident, without evidence that happened perhaps in Middlebury, perhaps in somewhere else. Um, not a lawyer, but working in child protection for years, uh, we had to look at various complaints that came in. And, and I had to learn the, the definition of hearsay, and I'll read it here. Evidence that is not within the personal knowledge of a witness, such as testimony regarding statements made by someone other than the witness, and that therefore may be inadmissible to establish the truth of a particular contention because the accuracy of the evidence cannot be verified. I think if we continue to chase these unsubstantiated assertions, we could spend lots of time. Um, but until there's actual evidence, I don't expect any state agency, whether it's the district, the, the state's attorney or the election commission to start chasing hearsay. Uh, we can continue to do that. Uh, if people want to continue to bring up hearsay, I'm going to continue to remind people what hearsay is. And I'm just going to close here with a quote from a recent court case. Our people, laws, and institutions demand more than strained legal arguments without merit and speculative accusations unsupported by evidence. That was in a Pennsylvania case by Judge Mann around election fraud. So I hope we can stick to the facts. If people want to bring evidence forward, I'm sure the Secretary of State's office would investigate actual evidence. But until then, I hope we can, we can stick to the facts. Uh, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Senning, do you have the town clerks um, is there a way that they track if there had been instances of people coming in and saying, um, oh, I thought I already voted, even the people that forgot they sent something in because they um, participated in the early mail-in voting, or do those only come in as like phone calls the night of, of like, hey, what do I do? Or do you have a record of, even though they were deemed to be, um, you know, a innocent of someone forgot that they voted, um, do you have a record of how many times that occurs? I know you said it was very few, but do you have an actual record? No, because of what you identified, Rep. Lefebvre, it, it, it happens in the course of phone calls and um, emails probably on election day or the day after. Thank you. All right, so Director Senning, why don't you um, share any other uh, information or thoughts you have uh, in response to the questions you heard us generate um, yesterday, and then we will move on to some of the other witnesses. I appreciate it, Madam Chair. I think I'm pretty much through my prepared stuff. I okay. do think the Deputy Secretary had a few more quick points to make. Great. Mr. Winters. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do just kind of want to put a bow on this um, voter fraud conversation. I do want to say that I, I hope I don't didn't leave the impression that we're purely complaint driven. We don't have to have an official complaint, uh, but what we do have to have is information and actionable information. So if we were to learn about some allegation of, of voter fraud, we would pursue it. We don't have to have someone actually report it to us. We, it could come to us through through other sources. And I just want to say the words voter fraud and election fraud 
really get thrown around rather lightly and in our view, irresponsibly these days. And it gets repeated so often that there are a lot of people in the public who've come to believe it must be true. Um, we also hear the allegation all the time that we don't try hard enough to look for voter fraud or we don't take it seriously. And I just wanna be perfectly clear that that's dead wrong. We have so many responsibilities at the Secretary of State's office and very serious responsibilities. But I'll tell you that election integrity is something that Secretary Condos takes as his, his primary goal. His primary role as the state chief elections officer is something he takes extremely seriously. And we think election integrity is really the most important responsibility that we have. So if we hear of someone cheating or committing some kind of election offense, that's offensive to us, that's offensive to every voter and we take it seriously. Um, as the secretary likes to say, the true voter fraud in this country that we see more than anything else is denying any eligible American the right to participate in our democracy. And fortunately, voter fraud is exceedingly rare and it's proved time and time again by national studies that it's rare. And we saw in 2020 that voting by mail is safe, it's simple, it's secure. And we now have proof from that 2020 general election with record numbers of voters participating and really no evidence of fraud. You heard the numbers. Um, and also I just point you out to the, the PowerPoint that um, is on your, your committee page now. Uh, we want to be clear, voter fraud does occur we're not denying that it occurs, but it's so infrequent that the numbers are well below one-tenth of one percent in every study that we've seen based on the data that the experts have analyzed. There are two links in that PowerPoint, one to the Justin Levitt study, which uh, looked at a billion votes and analyzed those votes and found 31 potential credible cases of voter fraud. And also there's the Brennan Center, which has done a ton of research, um, including specifically looking at vote by mail. And I'd, I'd uh, point those to, to your attention. So in addition to the Vermont 2020 election, we had the national elections um, where vote by mail opportunities were expanded due to the pandemic. Some states kind of struggled with that. Not all were as smooth and successful as we were here in Vermont. And they were uh, certainly challenges that they faced, but one thing that we did not see in the 2020 elections nationwide is any widespread fraud. Those 2020 elections were administered under the most difficult of circumstances and with intense scrutiny, with constant media coverage, with constant uh, partisans on both sides looking very closely at what was happening, with dozens and dozens of lawsuits. But what we saw was that these elections were certified uh, Post-election audits confirm the results, just, uh, just as ours did yesterday. Uh, the lawsuits were all thrown out, and it was due to a lack of evidence of fraud. So I guess just in conclusion that there are many threats to our elections and many things for us to worry about, uh, but voting by mail and increased voter participation are, are not among them. Uh, so I hope this testimony has answered a lot of your committee questions about checklist maintenance, about security measures, and about the myth of widespread voter fraud. And we'll stand by ready to answer other questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rep. Vyhovsky. And then we will go to Carol Dawes. Wonderful, thank you. So I have um, a couple of those other questions not related to security that I wanted to throw out there. And one of them is about the primaries um, and if there is any move to work towards universal mail ballots for the primaries and if you would be open to an opt-in or single sign-up. So once someone signs up for a primary ballot once, they don't necessarily have to do it every year. I'm worried that as this becomes more and more common, people are going to just expect that things come in the mail. And when it doesn't, they may miss the opportunity to vote. And I think we should be really trying to get people more involved in our primaries. Yes, Rep Fiofsky, I think the simple answer is yes. Um, for all the same reasons that we think it makes sense to mail a ballot to all active voters for the general election, we'd like to do so for the primary as well. And we've said since, since the beginning while working on this bill that um, that, would, that is the goal for the future, to get there. I, I won't go back over all of the issues that make that difficult with the primary. I think you're familiar with them, but that's, that's certainly the direction we want to move um, as soon as possible. 
And what was your second question? It was about single sign up. If we'd be open to including in this bill as an intermediary yeah. step, someone only asking once and then getting on a permanent list. I, we would, I would not be opposed to, to that. Um, just so you know, the current status of the law, like you said, I think, is that you have to do it each calendar year. And you're right, because elections only occur every two years, that means you have to think of it every other year um, to submit your standing requests for that whole year. And our system, I, I know, could accommodate that if, if that was the direction we went to, to identify permanent absentee voters. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my other question is just some clarification about the language around what happens if someone registers after the mailing list has gone out um, and how they would, are they able to register and get their absentee ballot kind of in the same space or like what does that process look like? The way that it's currently crafted, the, the, um, a ballot is not automatically sent to new registrants following the generation of the mailing list. And Carol can speak to it a little bit. I think that was a provision that I think that a lot of the clerks are, are very happy with because that um, continuing need to automatically send a ballot to anybody who registers after that time that we, that we did in this past November um, led to concern about issuance of multiple ballots to the same person having previously been issued them in the mailing. But we can thread that needle a little better, I think, with the language right now, um, which is I would, I would strongly say we should keep the language in that any voter that changes towns after that mailing deadline shouldn't be automatically sent a ballot because the clerk needs to first follow up, as the bill says, and determine the status of the ballot that was previously sent to that person in the previous town before doing so. Um, but having thought about it more, I think if we're talking only about first time registrants in Vermont after that time, um, we could add a provision that says for those first time registrants in Vermont, so there's no risk that they were already sent the ballot as part of the state mailing, that they should automatically be sent one at the time they register. Great, thank you so much. All right, um, Carol, us. Thank you so much for being with us on this bill last week. Um, and I apologize that we didn't get to you before um, before you had to leave last week, but we would love to hear your uh, thoughts and, and you're welcome to either go back to the beginning of the bill and run through or respond uh, specifically to the conversation you've heard today. Um, we would love to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for the record, Carol Dawes, Barry City Clerk Treasurer and Chair of the Legislative Committee for the Municipal Clerk and Treasurer's Association. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to take sort of a hybrid approach. Um, I, I'm going to uh, respond to a few things that, that I've heard, uh, make a few comments um, on behalf of the clerks and then be available to answer questions. Um, one thing that I, that I do want to uh, mention is, uh, since we were just talking about security, one of the tools that we have that, that wasn't talked about is the provisional ballot. Um, and we do have an opportunity, should a voter um, come to the polls and their name is already checked off, uh, and we're not able to problem solve it in the moment, um, as was mentioned before frequently that uh, in those instances, it's been election worker error, they marked off somebody a line above or a line below and we're able to uh, confirm that. Um, but if we're not able to do that, we can always have a voter vote provisionally. That's a process where we contact the Secretary of State's office. We let them know that we have this uh, situation going on. We allow the voter to vote and their ballot is sealed uh, in an envelope and set aside until we can do a little more research uh, and determine whether that, um, that ballot should be counted or not. Uh, and because we certify our elections uh, 48 hours after the conclusion, uh, the close of polls, it gives us time to do that due diligence um, if necessary. Uh, I will say in the 13 years I've been clerk, I've never issued a provisional ballot because those instances are, are extremely rare, uh, but it is a tool that we have. So 
Um, the with regards to the to the bill, um, the the clerks are are in um, support of the vast majority of it. Um, we have a few concerns. The majority of our concerns are about process, and we know that a lot of that is going to be worked out in conjunction with the Secretary of State's office. And we have a wonderful relationship with them. When we get down to you know how do we actually do this? This? How do we actually move forward with this? Uh, and the three things that that we uh, that we have talked about um, with regards to process is maintaining the voter checklist, and and both Will and Chris have gone over a, a considerable amount of information about that. Um, mailing ballots uh, to all the voters voting at the polls. And again, we've had quite a bit of conversation around that. And then the other thing is curing defective ballots. Uh, and I'm sure that we'll have more discussions uh, as we go along. With regards to checklist maintenance, um, one of the, the challenges that we have is around the automatic voter registration. Um, we're now seeing a tremendous number of voter registrations from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, and the, the, the concerns are around um, how robust the information is. Um, uh, Will or Chris mentioned that, that a lot of the discrepancies seem to be in um, data uh, provided by the, uh, the drivers or the people getting the, the non-driver IDs. Um, but we're finding that um, you know, they're, they're forwarded uh, to the wrong town. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that people don't know whether they live in Barry City or Barry Town, or their mailing address is in Marshfield, but they actually live in Plainfield. So they should be registered in Plainfield. So there are a lot of those um, discrepancies that clerks have to be really diligent about as we register um, voters that come in through the automatic voter registration. Um, and if there's a way to make the, the interface between DMV and the state system uh, more robust, that would be really helpful to the process. Um, the, the other thing Will had talked about um, this the Secretary of State's office gets a download from the DMV of all license holders um, with all their information so that driver's license numbers and dates of birth can be confirmed um, in the system. And it would be wonderful if there was a way to have those updates done in the system behind the scenes. Right now, if I have voters that are um, registered, but, but they they're sort of legacy voters. They've been a Vermont voter, uh, registered voter for 40 years. I may not have their driver's license number. I may not have their date of birth. And I have to go out and get that information. But clearly that information exists um, in the Secretary of State's office. And I don't know whether there is a way to have it interfaced and fill that information in behind the scenes. That would make the, the voter checklist um, uh, tighter as far as having information to be able to um, to to make uh, confirmations as far as whether voters are moving or changing names, addresses, that kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing is more of a recommendation. Um, we get, as Will mentioned, we get, or Chris uh, mentioned, we get on a monthly basis a list from the Secretary of State's office uh, of people who have died, a list they get from the Department of Health. And I have found personally that it's really helpful to um, not only check that list against my registered voters, but to check it against all the registered voters in the state. We, Barry City has a, a nursing home. We have a, a couple of senior living facilities and frequently voters or people will move into those facilities, um, but not transfer their voter registration. So they're not on my voter registration list. I can't change their, their status. I can't purge them. But what I do is I then reach out to the clerks who, um, 
who where they are a registered voter and let them know um, they can go ahead and purge them. So so creating some kind of system for for that would would help um, keep our our uh, checklist as up to date as possible. I'm going to just pause briefly to see if there's any questions on any of that. Um, then the next is with regards to the um, vote by mail uh, and curing defective ballots. Um, actually, uh, I think it was um, Rep Vahosky that mentioned uh, the, the potential for confusion do I get my ballot by mail or don't I get my ballot by mail for this particular election? And I think that that's um, that that is a, a potential for um, voter confusion. Um, and yet we need to make sure that we're maintaining uh, a balance um, between uh, the state elections and local control of local elections. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind with regards to town meetings and special town elections. Uh, I, right now, I think that the, the bill walks that, that line um, by allowing local authorities to make the decision as to whether they're going to do um, mail ballots or not. And I think that that's the right way to, to leave it. Um, is in the hands of the, the local officials. Um, the, just looking through my notes here. Um, one of the things, and I'm sure we'll get into more information about um, curing defective ballots, um, but that the process around that is, is probably the things that the, that the clerks are, are most concerned about, just wanting to make sure that the steps are laid out really clearly. One of the biggest concerns we have is our ability to contact voters, um, our, actually our limited ability to contact voters. We don't have phone numbers. We don't have email addresses. We have a few scattered information, but certainly nothing that we can depend upon. We do have mailing addresses. And so as the bill is currently crafted with the postcard notification, um, that certainly is the one that, that covers the most bases with regards to the information we have. Um, but there are still concerns about, you know, what is the process once a, a voter has been notified? Um, as an example, one of the reasons that uh, ballots can be determined uh, as defective is if the ballot is not in the certificate envelope. Um, I'm actually preparing for a school budget re vote on May 11th. We've received a little over 700 um, absentee ballots back at this stage of the game and 14 of them, so 2% are defective at this stage of the game. Um, and 10 of those 14 are defective because the ballot was not in the certificate envelope. It seems to me that perhaps there's a, a better cure for that instance than to make that person come into the office to put their ballot in the envelope. Um, that maybe there's a different way to cure that. Or maybe it's not something that should rise to the level of defect. Um, I, I don't know, but I think it's something that should be looked at. Um, the other step that, that we'll need um, guidance on is if, I, if a ballot is deemed defective and I mail the, uh, uh, the voter a new ballot, what happens to that defective ballot? It obviously can't be kept in my defective ballot envelope because that's the, that number of those ballots is counted, accounted for at the end of the election. So we'll need to figure out what is the process associated with that ballot that has been deemed defective and, and ultimately replaced by a cured ballot. Um, so that will need to be worked out. Um, and then the other thing that has been uh, that is addressed in the bill, but but I think needs to be worked through and probably uh, mostly through the through the process through through procedures and, and rulemaking is um, working out 
all the details about a voter who chooses to come to the polls in person. They've had the ballot mailed to them. They come with the, the voted ballot. They want it, feed it through the tabulator themselves or put it in the ballot box themselves, or they don't have their ballot with them. I know that all those procedures are laid out in the bill, but I know that clerks are concerned about you know, having to have all those bits and pieces in place, affidavits, is this the right voter gets this affidavit? Just making sure that the processes um, make sense for, uh, for at the polls um, when we're, we're busy. Um, just wanna make sure that we're, we're, making, we're making sense with that. Um, clerks are in huge support of allowing early processing of ballots into the tabulators or ballot boxes. That has been, that was a, a, a godsend during the November election and during uh, recent town meeting elections. Um, and particularly with a move towards more mail voting, um, being able to early process is, is extremely helpful. Um, we really support the ballot drop boxes, um, certainly support the, the opportunity to do outdoor polling or drive-through voting um, as the, the, uh, the needs may, um, may warrant. So um, those are what I have for notes and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Carol. Um, I, I have talked to a handful of town clerks um, since the November election. And, um, and you know, we, we did a, a fair amount of debrief on the November election uh, earlier this session. And so I'm just wondering with respect to this new, um, this new concept of being able to cure your ballot, you know, do, is, is it your experience that the Secretary of State's elections folks um, have done a good job of, uh, of issuing guidance and training town clerks um, and then also being available for the, okay, this is the scenario, what do I do now kind of question? Right, sort of like here are the rules and here are the exceptions to all the rules. Um, the uh, yes, it, generically the the Secretary of State's office is great about those sort of one on one, uh, unique instances uh, and, and helping figure that out. Um, I find that the the um, the election management uh, handbook um, is a godsend during uh, the election seasons. Um, the go-to, uh, what I love about any of the, the handbooks is that not only do they give you really practical applications for the statutes, they also give you the statutory reference. So you can look at the actual language that's behind the guidance. Um, so I, I think that they're, they provide a, a lot of really good um, guidance. Um, Will has mentioned election bulletins um, they get sent to us, uh, out to us on a regular basis. They're, they're particularly well-timed um, because the election uh, elections all have a, a cycle, um, things that have to be done at a particular time. Um, and the, the bulletins are really good about coming out and going, remember in the next week you have to do X and then you have to do Y the following week. And um, so, yeah, so they, they have, uh, they've been really wonderful about providing that guidance. Um, obviously, we haven't done, dealt with uh, curing defective ballots yet, but my, my hope would certainly be that, uh, that we would get similar support and guidance um, uh, uh, down that road, um, and clerks aren't afraid to go back to the Secretary of State's office and go, no, 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 we need more, we need different, we need better, so, um, and they're always, uh, they're always very open to that. Um, Secretary Condos has a, a, a group of clerks um, that he meets with generally at least once a year um, to talk about all kinds of issues that, that might be on the table, coming down the pike, things that need to be tweaked. Um, and they're, they're very responsive. Thank you. Representative LaFave has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Ms. Dallas, for being here. I just wanted to thank you for uh, saying what I was trying to say much more clear before in my test when I was um, speaking. I said that once a ballot is casted, there's no way to redact that. And from my experience of counting um, this past 
um, election with the town with the town meeting day, you know, I knew that all of the defective ballots got put in a bag, clearly labeled defective, but we still had to count to make sure the amount of votes casted matched the amount of votes that were counted. And so that was my question. And I, you know, I thank you for saying it much more clear than what I was, you know, asking is what how do you how do you fix that then? You know, like how do you how do you get rid of that ballot and you know and not have your numbers messed messed up. And that's one of, one of my questions I have um, about hearing ballots. Um, and I do appreciate that if we're going to be putting in other measures um, for the ability for clerks to have the information that you guys need to contact. Um, and I am surprised hearing the uh, struggle of you guys being able to contact a voter um, just from the information that you aren't given. You know, I think if we're going to be giving the integrity of the, of voting to the town clerks where you know the responsibility is and you know it should be um that we need to be giving you the tools to work with efficiently also um so i appreciate hearing what you know would be more useful for you and more helpful for you to have this be a safe and streamlined process so thank you for speaking up about that as well um just one one thing i would say with regards to defective um ballots it's not that they that the votes are counted because those ballots never leave their envelope and get included in the um sorry i we've changed our phone system and i can't figure out how to shut it off <laughs> so um the uh the the ballots aren't counted because the 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 ballot never comes out of the defective envelope the the voter is checked off the checklist and is counted amongst the people who cast a ballot but the votes themselves on the ballot are not counted Correct. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I meant, you know, we had 50 people walk in. We have 50 votes. You know, we have 50 voter, you know, 50 ballots to be accounted for. That was the point I was trying to make. You know, you had 50 people on your check in. You should have 50 people on your check out. And we should have 50 ballots here that we are we're counting regardless, you know, and the ones that are defective, they still count as the 50 in and the 50 out because their votes never make it to the total tallies of the election. So thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I'd reached out to all five of my uh, town clerks as well. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that uh, uh, one of the concerns or some of the concerns is around the, the cured process. Um, again, uh, as you had mentioned, uh, they had talked about limited uh, ability to contact these folks. Um, and I'm just curious whether or not uh, in specifics, uh, the provision about uh, not later than one business day clerks will mail out a postcard. Uh, is, is that a concern right there as far as the actual wording in that section of the bill? It, it is a concern. The, the concern, uh, first of all, the, they have to be data entered into the system within three days. And then if there's a, a defective uh, ballot that that the postcard has to be mailed out within within a day. Um, in my office, I have three staff. Um, I've got more people to do that kind of work. Um, smaller offices where a clerk uh, may be the only person and they may not even be a full time clerk. Um, there are concerns uh, uh, about that. Um, and I, I don't I don't know what the what the perfect number of days is. Um, obviously, the 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 number one priority is making sure that if we're going to offer uh, an opportunity to cure, that we want to offer as much opportunity as possible. So, getting the information out to the voter as soon as possible is is the most important thing. Um, it, it's just finding finding what works. It, it's it's hard to to find one scenario that works across the board from towns my size down to towns where you know the clerk works three mornings a week so right and, and again that was uh one of their other concerns at least by a couple of the towns that uh, they didn't feel that they had the help that they needed uh and again that might be uh you know a select board issue not not uh, allowing that to happen or whatever but they really they really were were stressed so I, my hope is that um, that 
we're doing this as sort of a, a, a two-part approach. Not only are we coming up with a, a way to cure defective ballots, but that working with the Secretary of State's office, um, who through this bill would now have more freedom with regards to the creation, the language on the certificate envelope, that we come up with, with stronger ways to, um, to keep people from uh, having a defective ballot to begin with, and that that would certainly reduce the number of uh, ballots that we would be dealing with um, for having to send the postcards out. I think that there are ways um, through the, through the changes, through changes on the certificate envelope, um, through, uh, through press releases, outreach to the public. I think there are, are ways to cut down on the number of defective ballots and that that in conjunction with a process for curing, um, will, they will work hand in glove. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Representative McCarthy. Uh, hi, Carol. Um, this conversation made me think of a question that I had when we were just doing the overview yesterday. Um, and in the, I guess, an existing law, and as it's modified, you know, uh, in, I think this is in section 13, um, the way it's written right now in the, in S15, it says beginning 30 days before the opening of polls, you know, clerks can, uh, uh point to people to start processing the ballots. And I'm wondering um, if it would make sense to consider making that longer so that clerks could start doing that when they start receiving ballots back instead of it being a 30 day window and having that fixed and maybe Wilk could weigh in on that too. I, to me, because 30 days is so much longer than what we had before, it, it seems like plenty of time. Um, in, here in Barry City, we didn't take uh, advantage of that, that opportunity. Um, what I love about it is the flexibility. You can do what works best for your community. For me, it's easier to get people to work at the polls. And so it's easier for me to process the, the ballots at the polls than it is to get people to come in um, in the days leading up to it. Um, I, I don't know you know, the ballots go out approximately 45 days before you could gain a couple weeks. I, I'm not sure whether, um, because they would come in in a trickle at the beginning there, I'm not sure whether a clerk would find that useful or not. Um, you know, certainly giving clerks uh, added uh, time, you know, there may be some clerks who would find that useful. Will, do you have some thoughts on that? I don't think um, we, we wouldn't be opposed to any extension of that period, but the points that Carol makes are good ones. It's actually the 43rd day, which is a Monday, when we'll start mailing the ballots. If it takes two or three days for transmission each way, um, that probably would only gain you at most a week of early processing. Um, but I, I wouldn't be opposed to language that would allow for that if that's the desire of the committee. Great, thanks. That really answers my, my question. When I was reading that, I was reading it as why are we putting a limit? But now I'm understanding based on what Will and Carol are saying is that for clerks in Vermont, that's just plenty of time to do the processing and we won't run into what other states ran into with processing delays just because of the volume of the votes that we're gonna get in each town is a lot lower than in some places that had issues. So thanks. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Carol, and you know, I haven't found it uh, again, but the language about being able to process the ballots early, um, is it my recollection that that's permissive language? Yes. And in order for this ballot curing to work, it couldn't be permissive anymore then. Wouldn't there have to be some sort of a deadline put in place that you have to start processing those mail-in ballots earlier because then it defeats the purpose of the ballot curing, doesn't it? 
There, there are two different things. Um, there is, uh, there is a timeline associated with when a ballot comes in being data entered into the system. And when it's data entered into the system, that's when you make note of whether a ballot is defective or not. When I say data entered into the system, I mean um, into the Vermont uh, election management system, not um, processed into the tabulator or the ballot box. This is just a data entry process. Um, and if a ballot is determined to be uh, defective at that stage of the game, then you would begin the process of mailing out the postcard oh, okay. and stuff. So, okay. so that's separate from the um, from the actual processing of ballots into the tabulator or ballot box. I see. Okay. And so what's the understanding as far as getting the ballots into the, um, the management system? How, how long do you have to do that? The language as proposed in the bill is three days. Okay. And the other question that I have would be, uh, well, let me back up, is I recognize it's three days, but what is it currently? Is it, is there, anything there, there isn't anything in statute currently about data entry. Okay. And the other question I have is around the ballot curing, um, of those that you're representing, how many would you say are in favor of that and how many would you say um, have some significant reservations? I, I, <laughs> you know, we, we haven't conducted any polls, but, you know, anecdotally, I would say 25% have severe uh, reservations, 25% are in full support, and 50% are playing the wait and see, let's figure out what the process is going to be. That's fair. Okay, thank you. That sounds about right. <laughs> Madam Chair, could I add just one thought to, to that Absolutely. answer for Rep. LeClaire? Rep. LeClaire, it's good questions, and I, I remember testimony, I think, that I gave in the Senate where I noted that sort of of all the provisions in the bill, just what you just zeroed in on is um, the place where we're really making a new responsibility for the clerks. And it's that three day time frame to determine that a ballot's defective and enter that in the system. But you, you simply can't avoid that to have an effective and fair curing process. Right, thank you. All right, so we have some other folks who are gathered with us here this afternoon uh, to respond to some aspects of the bill. Um, actually, we're not in afternoon, we're in morning still, but you know, time means nothing uh, in this COVID meeting world. Um, so first I wanna welcome Falco Schilling, who's here with the ACLU of Vermont and uh, welcome and please share your thoughts on S15. Uh, good morning, and for the record, my name is Falco Schilling. I'm the Advocacy Director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Vermont, and I appreciate you having me in this morning to testify on S15. Um, and I do want to say that it's, it's definitely a pleasure to be coming forward to testify on this bill. When I talk to my colleagues around the country, many of them are having spent significant amounts of time fighting a, a back uh, laws and proposed uh, laws which would really restrict access to the ballot box in, in unconscionable ways. So it is a pleasure to be coming forward uh, in front of you today to talk about how we can move forward and successfully implement um, a universal vote by mail system moving forward, especially after seeing that it was such a great success in the 2020 elections. As you've heard from others, this has allowed people to vote safely um, and also increase participation where we heard, had almost 445,000 uh, extra vote, new voters um, above our, our previous uh, record total. So just wanted to share our broad support for S15 uh, in terms of moving us to a place where more Vermonters can vote more easily. We're, we're greatly supportive of that. I did also wanna to speak to some of the concerns that I've heard through some of the testimony specifically yesterday around um, the issue of signature matching requirements. Uh, this is something that is of concern to the ACLU, both here in Vermont and around the country. Uh, and so we would not be supportive of including a signature matching requirement in this piece of legislation because such a requirement uh, could disenfranchise many people unnecessarily and just increase workload by uh, creating more ballots of, that would be defective. And the people who are most likely to be uh, disenfranchised with a signature voting requirement from what we've seen 
are people who are often already marginalized. This includes people who are younger. This includes people with disabilities. This includes women. This includes people who are transgendered or gender nonconforming. Um, and for a number of different reasons, um, and I can walk through quickly why that might happen. So if you think of someone who has disabilities, uh, for example, our client for the ACLU of New Hampshire um, brought a challenge to New Hampshire's signature verification law because she was blind. Um, her signature did not appear the same way on multiple ballots because she could not actually sign it the same way or even see it. Um, that law was overturned because there was not adequate uh, notice and curing requirements in that law, which are generally the, the major concerns that we would have with any law moving forward that has a signature verification requirement, that there be adequate notice um, as well as opportunity to cure. So if you also, we've seen uh, from examples in places like Florida, where would there have been analysis of the vote by mail system, both in the 2020 and the 2018 election, younger people are more likely to have their ballots uh, uh, found to be defective at a rate at almost three times the rest of other voters. And this is also true for racial and ethnic minorities. Um, where their votes are rejected at a higher rate than those of, of, of white voters. Uh, beyond that, uh, people whose names have changed, uh, so women who might change their names uh, and, and might either be developing a new signature because women are more likely to change their name after marriage, um, might have a signature that evolves over time and is more likely to be mismatched, or if they're trying to recreate a name that they, their, their previous name, uh, that's another issue where those signatures might be mismatched. Um, similar for people who are transgendered or gender nonconforming, where they might be going by a new name, developing a new signature, or being asked to revert to a previous name where they are no longer using that signature regularly. So these are just a couple of the different groups of people who are more likely to have their ballots uh, found to be defective and disenfranchised if we were to institute this type of requirement. Um, so I'm not gonna go deeply into what we think would be required um, in terms of due process notice uh, and curing opportunities, if this were to be put into the law because we do not support including a signature verification requirement in the law, but would say that it would, it would require a significant uh, amount of resources and more time on the parts of the town clerks because you would need significant training into signature verification. Uh, we would also wanna make sure that those when ballots are disqualified, that there's an opportunity for due process and nonpartisan review of those disqualifications, and then adequate time for notification of that voter, and then adequate time to, in fact, cure that ballot when they are notified. So that would add significant amount of process um, to for folks, for town clerks around the state. Um, and generally, because we see the threat of election fraud is so low, as described by the Secretary of State's office so well earlier, we would not support including signature verification in this bill because we think it would dis unnecessarily disenfranchise many verbal monitors, especially a number of those who are already marginalized uh, or from traditionally marginalized communities. So uh, trying to keep it somewhat short because I know we have some other witnesses uh, up today, but just want to say we support this bill and moving forward, um, but would have serious concerns about a signature matching requirement. Thank you for being with us today. Um, committee members, any questions um, for Mr. Schilling? All right. Uh, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here today and providing your testimony. Um, so we do have language that we are looking at that will allow ballots to be cured. Do you support that? Yes, that we support the language that in there that would allow the curing of ballots. We think that's important. Um, what I was trying to convey is that if there was a signature matching requirement, that curing of ballots uh, the provision might need to be more robust uh, with more opportunities for curing and more requirements on town clerks in terms of uh, the due process needed after the determination that a ballot was defective. But uh, the curing provision within the bill currently is something that we do support. Okay, thank you. Rep Pigley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was just curious, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of the ones that's been uh, supportive of some sort of a signature verification or some form of verification. I've got a call into the Secretary of State's office in Oregon, um, haven't uh, received a call back. Uh, as, as you are probably aware, they're as busy as we are with issues. Um, so, um, 
Oh, a matter of fact, I have uh, Oregon on the phone right now. So I will ask this question after I talk to uh, the Secretary of State from Oregon. Thank you. All right. Um, next, I'd like to invite Mark Hughes to uh, share any thoughts or reactions to the bill, um, either generally uh, on the whole bill or if you have specific parts of the conversation and testimony we've been taking that you'd like to react to. So Mark Hughes, welcome and um, feel free to share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mark Hughes, Executive Director of Justice for All. I will be um, providing some comments um, that are um, thoughts of my own, as well as uh, justice for all today. I'm not here to represent the Racial Justice Alliance. <clears throat> also brought with me a couple uh, couple slides, if, if in case um, I may get to those, I'll, I'll try to um, figure that out, but it might, I think having a, some images might help you <clears throat> along the way. Um, for those of you who know me, you, you also know that I'm a, a retired army officer um, and I've been in um, Vermont for about 12 years. Uh, you know, voting is something that um, has been very important to me personally uh, for my entire life. Uh, and, um, you know, I've voted in, um, you know, upwards of probably about <clears throat> 12 or 15 states and, and I've voted, uh, you know, absentee, absentee ballot uh, remotely. Uh, and it, the first question that comes to my mind when I think about this subject is, is you know, how do, how do you feel when you go into the polls? How, how do you feel when you go into the polls? And I had a conversation with a group of people of color and some black folks about uh, this uh, very question. And, um, and you know, the answer, you know, has varied from uncomfortable uh, to uh, scrutinized to judged, to um, just uh, weird, uh, awkward, and you know, and the list goes on. I'm talking about um, my own personal experiences as well. Um, and I know that um, our country has a, a incredibly rich history of black folks in the polls or uh, the absence thereof. So I came to you know, offer some testimony on this um, because of my uh, deep uh, concern, uh, both nationally uh, and statewide. Um, it's very difficult to have a conversation about the historical context of voting in the United States and the um, particularly it framed in a, a reference of systemic uh, racism if you're talking to a person who doesn't believe that that exists. And I understand that. Um, but uh, what I will say is, is that, you know, if nothing else, I suppose it might be a good idea to take a look at something that Governor Phil Scott said, and that is, is uh, just a couple of years ago, and I think it was in his, um, I think it might have been his annual, or it could have been his budget speech. He said, we don't need more taxes, we need more taxpayers. And I thought about that and also think about the number of folks that are coming into the states and the demographic, the state rather, and the demographic, the racial demographic of those folks. Now, it doesn't take a, a, a scientist to figure this out, uh, but uh, the state is changing. Um, uh, take it or leave it, like it or not, the state's changing. Um, and uh, these, you know, racial, the racial demographics of the state is changing and um, the voters uh, as a result, uh, or I should say the taxpayers, guess what? They're also voters. Uh, so, um, so this is really important, a uh, really important conversation, uh, particularly uh, when we're talking about uh, historical disenfranchisement. Now, one thing that we know for sure is, is that there is very little evidence uh, that there's any widespread voter fraud, contrary to any uh, crazy uh, scheme that you might hear on the news there is very little evidence of uh, any voter fraud, very little uh, across the United States. And we've just proven as a nation uh, that we can conduct an election um, with record turnout uh, effectively. 
So I, I, so I didn't come to try to explain uh, to the committee uh, the, the, uh, just how um, largely safe this is, but I did uh, come to um, just add some color, if you will, uh, to the conversation uh, surrounding uh, our position on this policy. Uh, this policy is necessary. Uh, this, you know, when we talk about <clears throat> the ability to vote and to make it um, as convenient uh, and effective uh, as possible, <clears throat> particularly uh, for groups of folks um, like the one that I represent and others <clears throat> uh, who have his historically uh, been uh, denied that opportunity, uh, it's incredibly important. Uh, it's uh, probably um, one of the most important things that I can come into your committee to talk to you about, hard stop. So um, <clears throat> just, I'll go over Bill, just I got a couple comments on the bill, uh, maybe four or five points. Um, and, uh, and then um, I'd also like to just also connect this with some other broader uh, and historical and also um, immediately present uh, challenges that are set before this committee that tie to the remnants of this state's uh, historical disenfranchisement uh, of folks <clears throat> and uh, some of the work that you've already done in that area and some of the work that you still have in front of you. To the policy, I would just say that um, it's probably maybe, like I said, five or four or five points, um, you know, we support the policy. Uh, uh, the uh, Justice for All supports the policy. Uh, there's a couple uh, exceptions that, that I'll get to here towards the end that you know, I really think that they, they just require some more attention. But uh, if you go to section eight over in, uh, and, and look at uh, um, uh, section eight um, sec, uh, and three, uh, section eight, three A, there's some conversation there about, and I'll just read it to you. It's, it's, uh, it says uh, after the semicolon after uh, 230, uh, 2537A of this subchapter, it says, before issuing an absentee ballot, the clerk shall confirm the status of the ballot uh, that was previously mailed uh, um, to that voter by the Secretary of State and proceed as follows. So I think I get what this, what's going on there, but I, I just, you know, in reviewing that and, and kicking that around, we just thought it, it would just be good for a person just to file an affidavit. Uh, just straight up on the upfront of that process. Uh, just if if you if you relocated and you're and um, you're um, you're going to vote, uh, just uh, uh, if if I understand this 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 section correctly, um, if you know, this is talking about a voter's transfer uh, from um, from one area to another an, uh, another part of the city, um, and it looks like there's this elongated process that's in there, and I think it would just be. Uh, really cut and dry if that voter just went, if they went to vote it. And, um, and hopefully on the back end of all of this, uh, in the um, unlikely, but uh, certainly possible event that there was some kind of fraud, that there would be checks and balances on the back end. And we see that in this policy. We see it in this policy that there is a way to, to uh, reconcile these votes on the back end. Uh, point number two is um, uh, over in your section, um, Section 10, um, if you look at section 10 uh, in, uh, that's a 2543 return of ballots. And if you just uh, go on down to um, <clears throat> uh, D, uh, item D where it starts in that um, all voter absentee ballots returned. This is minor, but there's some language challenges with that sentence right there. Uh, it's a little confusing. Uh, where it says uh, as follows, shall be counted, and then it goes into those categories. I'd ask you just to take a closer look at that. It might be a better way to, to flesh that out in terms of what we're trying to articulate there. It does create a little confusion. And the last thing we want in this policy is confusion. Um, and then over in, um, as, a, um, as a third point, if you just go over to section, uh, section 11, if you're looking at section 11, you can just nod at me if you get there. And then over, uh, if you look at, and that's 2543A, <clears throat> if you look at uh, uh, item F, um, 
and uh, section uh, uh, sub subsection six there, it, it talks about, um, and we're talking about drop boxes now and in, in the allocation and we're, we're getting into uh, where there's over 20,000 voters, which is really rare, uh, uh, 20,000 registered voters in, in that particular area. And, um, the, and um, it talks about representative districts and I'm assuming these are statewide districts. I think there are seven here in the city of Burlington. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure this is just for clarity um, that we're actually talking about statewide representative districts um, because I, I, I wasn't quite sure there. Maybe it's just my knowledge deficiency, um, but I, I came across a little um, challenge understanding why that section was there because it's, it's such a rare occurrence, uh, but definitely wanted to clarify what uh, representative districts uh, what the you know what the definition of that was. Moving on to four, if you go to a uh, section uh, twelve, um, <clears throat> section twelve. Uh, no, scratch that. We're, we're moving. On, we're moving on to um, just towards the end, and I think this is really. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, stop for a minute. I see Representative Higley has his hand up. And before we move on, I had a couple of other points, but I'll just give everybody to ask some opportunity to ask some questions right now, and then I can go to the, the last part. Thank you. I, I, I think that um, it's possible that Rep Higley didn't put his hand down from before, but um, Will, could you confirm for us um, that in places such as Burlington that has um, different districts that they may have more than the five or six um, drop boxes? Yes, that's right. And I think uh, what Mark was asking too is that it is referring to state representative districts, Mark, and it's more common than you might think. For instance, there's four in South Burlington, um, the seven you mentioned in Burlington, but that's what it refers to. Great. Um, Representative Yehovsky has a question. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify with you, Director Senning, that a town can have more drop boxes than representative districts. It is simply that the Secretary of State's office will supply that number, correct? Right. Okay, so the town could have as many, well, I mean, as many as they wanted, if, but they have to supply them above and beyond what's in this bill. Correct. And they would have to locate them as the bill directs. Awesome. Um, so thank you, Mark, if you had, um, if you had any slides or documents that you wanted to share with the committee, you're welcome to email them to our committee assistant and she can get them up any page. Okay. So um, I'll just, <clears throat> I'll just go on to my next points and I'll, I'll hold on the slides. Thank you. I'll, I'll start by saying that, um, before I go into this section is, is, as you know, with, uh, PR2 on your wall right now, the constitutional amendment uh, and some of the work that you've done uh, historically uh, with, um, uh, I think last biennium with title 17, uh, chapter 32, removing those 16 occurrences of the term Freeman. Uh, also, it still existing in uh, title 24, um, in appendix of title 24 in chapter seven, uh, in, in chapter three, rather, uh, uh, three and seven, and 28 through uh, 31 for Burlington and Virgins is uh, their uh, charters, the term, the terminology Freeman. And also, by the way, in Senate, existing Senate Rule 8, the term being used Freeman, uh, the uh, uh, chapter 42 of the Constitution is where this language starts, and it, it is what undergirds uh, the, the entire voting or the entire uh, system of voting in this state is where it's first used <clears throat> Freeman. It was removed a couple dozen iter iterations of it under the auspices of degenderization in 1994. Uh, as again, uh, it was removed uh, in Title 17, your committee removed it in, titles, uh, in Title 17 uh, and I think it was S107. Uh, and the reason why I'm, I'm uh, getting at this is because this terminology was always used um, 
to delineate um, the, um, the, the, uh, the voting rights in the state, uh, the federal, as well as the constitutional amendment referendum. So when, whenever there was a state, whenever there were a state, uh, state elections, federal elections, or state constitutional referendums. Further, whenever um, the further the qualifications for any person running from those offices was also divine, defined uh, by this terminology, uh, this terminology called Freeman. So what I want to do is, is I want to make sure that we're setting the stage to the conversation that we're having because we are not a state that has never um, that has never suppressed voters in this state. Uh, many of you who are on the call still remember your um, your um, uh, Freeman's oath that you used to take about maybe eight years ago uh, before we got rid of that. So the conversation is relevant. It's not that far in the past how the this state has uh, delineated uh, from not just folks who can vote, but also folks who would be qualified to hold a statewide office, uh, to be qualified to hold a federal office, and also those folks uh, who could even vote on a referendum, that is to change the constitution, okay? Which we are doing with PR2. <clears throat> and I encourage you uh, to get to that as soon as you can and get those hearings happening. Now, I take you now to section 21, 2021 and 21A. <clears throat> because these are the sections of the, this uh, bill that have really um, been afforded the least amount of attention uh, and, uh, and I think that are most problematic as it pertains to those folks who would be disenfranchised or those folks uh, who uh, would, um, who would who need. Well, first of all, let, let's just start here. Uh, Section 20, um, language access. <clears throat> Come on, guys. Um, we've been kicking this can down the road for a long time uh, about language access. We're talking about language. We've already done it. We just did it this last year. Uh, and every single time uh, we come to a conversation about much of anything to do with allocation of resources or uh, privileges, um, what, I'm, what I'm seeing, what, what, what I'm experiencing here, what my response to this is, is that we just can't seem to figure this one out. Um, and so what we have here again uh, is uh, a kicking of the can down the road uh, on this uh, particular issue. This, uh, and I just would go to it for those who are watching. The Secretary of State's office shall consult with municipalities um, and interested, interested stakeholders on best practices. Now I have some recommendation here, so I'm not just here to tell you what's wrong with it. Um, um, for increasing access to voting for non-English speaking Vermonters and Vermonters with limited English proficiency and provide recommendations to Senate and House committees on government operations and so on and so forth. So just note there that this, the Secretary of State's office is being tasked with that. And I'm going to skip over to 21A uh, and uh, note that the, uh, there's also a voting access report. The reason why I did that is, is these are interrelated. Uh, both of them say access, both of them are a report. Uh, so um, what this says, uh, for those who can't, um, who, who can't see what I'm reading here, is is on or before January 30th, 2023, the Secretary of State's office shall submit a written report to the House and Senate committees on government operations with the findings and any recommendations for legislative action on A, uh, issues related to implementing universal vote by mail for mun municipal and primary elections, and B, uh, the impact uh, expanding vote, uh, the impact expanding vote by mail would have on A, uh, access to voting among those who have historically been disenfranchised in populations that have historically had lower, lower voter turnout, which is very similar to section 20, if not the same. Uh, and um, publish satisfaction with voting process and also the administration of elections. So, um, I, I think what what I'm what I'm what I came to ask of you is is that if you would consider uh, committee um, that what we do is is we would um, address this idea of access uh, with a sense of urgency uh, that we also um, uh, invest. Uh, some resources uh, to um, perhaps an outside entity 
uh, doing some of this work. Um, the reason why I'm, I'm suggesting an outside entity uh, is, is because I think there is some ongoing work that needs to be done in these areas that needs to be consistent. Uh, it needs to be really targeted, focused, uh, and there is a, um, there's an effort, obviously, that needs to go into this work that's reporting back, uh, back out to, to you. Um, I think that, um, you know, back in, to item 21, um, it's good that um, there is a creation and funding of a position, although that the, it's not really clearly defined what, exactly what that assistance is going to be doing. There's some high level stuff. I would propose that, uh, Will, uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, that this, um, that this um, position that we're proposing creating or an additional position would be created that would be focused on election equity. Uh, that this, this position would be focused on doing this work throughout this entire period and into perpetuity uh, as far as how we go about ensuring uh, that there's equity in this election process as opposed to uh, periodically reaching out to an activist, activist in the community who has to blow out half his day to come and testify to you generally and usually not, um, doesn't, doesn't, feel, doesn't feel like you're always listening all the time, but um, to come in um, and, and offer you that testimony or to just give the Secretary of State's office additional responsibilities that are related to it and just have them come back with some kind of report later on down the road. So, so I think that um, these three areas, section 20, 21, and 21A, in the, in the current state that they are in, um, though we support this entire uh, effort, uh, we find this language to be unacceptable in this current state. I think we can do better with this language. So I'm gonna stop there, uh, see if there's any uh, questions or anything like that. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come out and uh, share with y'all and. And I think uh, Will was wanting to get in, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, and just for committee's expectation, um, I'm going to ask us to continue through um, a, a few more witnesses because we do have two other folks with us this morning. Um, so we'll continue a little bit into the lunch hour. But I did want to ask Director Senning if you uh, can help orient the committee to, um, to what your office is already doing and uh, and maybe respond to the uh, points that Mr. Hughes has made. Sure, I'm happy to. And thanks, Mark, for your testimony and commentary. I appreciate it. Um, a few things. So the language that Mark identified, um, the first section 21 was added in the Senate um, after discussing what we can do um, to go further in um, improving our services to non-English speaking voters and improving access generally to um, populations that may have been historically underserved. And the language that was that um, is included, I believe was um, the, the brainchild of Senator Rahm and we supported the inclusion of that language, how it's written right now to um, sort of formalize and put at least a date on um, bringing information back to the committees about next steps in this process. And I say next steps because um, it's actually an area of the work that I've done since I've been director that I'm really proud of um, and that I've devoted a lot of attention to uh, that I wasn't required to, but that I did because it's right and it should be done. Um, and so the, the only real offense I take is the suggestion that I haven't listened to um, suggestions in this regard. And just really quickly, I know we're running low on time, um, Madam Chair, but it's been two election cycles now, 2018 and 2020, when we've engaged in a pilot project with the cities of Burlington and Winooski to provide translated election materials, uh, sample ballots, and uh, instructional videos that we've then worked closely with those communities to make sure they were circulated as effectively as possible. Um, including appointing sort of ambassadors among the various communities in Burlington and Winooski to um, make it known that these resources were available and help communicating about those resources and how to participate. Um, in 2018, we launched this pilot project 
We had two in-person events in Winooski um, and Burlington. Representative Colson attended the one in Winooski um, where we presented information on voter access, how to register, how to request an absentee ballot, what you're gonna find at the polling place. You can view the videos that came out of that effort on our website. Um, none of this was mandated by law. Federal law sets um, percentages of population um, after which you have to provide translated election materials. Vermont doesn't come close to any of those thresholds at this point. Um, but because the issues were raised to us back in 2018, we took it upon ourselves to do this effort voluntarily. Um, and I was really clear in the Senate that we intend to continue that work. I am in um, consistent communication with the group we've been working with in Burlington and Winooski, and Winooski on this um, continually. And we intend to do more and better. And at the same time, I was not opposed to sort of formalizing that work uh, with the report that's referred to in the law. And then um, the sort of repetitive nature of Section 21A, um, I think is really just a result of the legislative process in the Senate, um, where that second report in 21A was sort of a compromise um, uh, instead of the formation of a commission to study all of these things and many other things in addition to language access. Um, we felt that it was a more, more efficient for our office to present that report after engaging with stakeholders and interested parties. Um, in a lot of ways, because we've already been doing so for four years and have a lot of built up knowledge about um, what that will take. And so all I can tell the committee is I'm, I'm committed to continuing that effort um, and to do everything we can as an office to increase resources for non-English speaking and other underserved populations. Thank you, Director Sending. Committee members, any questions um, either for Mr. Hughes or um, for uh, Director Sending on his response to that section? All right, please stick around folks. We've got a few more to uh, to hear from. So um, Morgan- Chair, if I might um, <clears throat> just uh, offer just a brief response uh, just in follow up with uh, what uh, uh, Will uh, saying is uh, saying to us is is that um, just for clarification. Um, first of all, um, I was actually directing my comment to your committee, Madam Chair, because uh, I think this is about my fourth, third or fourth time in the committee, and there there's, is I have had a sense of frustration uh, in my testimony to the committee. I understand the committee must synthesize uh, what we as a community a constituent, a commun the community representatives uh, bring to your committee, but we've just seen uh, very, very little um, come out of this committee or any other committee for that matter, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, session on uh, equity. And, and, and I won't go down the list of bills that are stalled in the house uh, or the one that crossed over that's completely unacceptable. So that was in fact uh, directed at the committee unapologetically and, uh, and I hope it's enough to go around for the, in, the entire legislative process. So uh, some folks can leave the committee and carry that or else they could just take it as a general sentiment uh, and just be mindful of it. Um, the other thing is, is just, I just wanted to just flag the, um, the uh, defensive nature in which the Secretary of State's office representative here just came back at me with. Uh, and also um, just make, make sure that's just kind of highlighted in this process. Um, particularly given all of the things that were just named, um, it just it makes it less sensible that in this policy, you know, given the fact that um, you know all of these activities have happened in the Burlington and Winooski area, and all of this this work that's been done. By the way, it's notable that none of it was mandated. That's very important because it must be. It should be. Uh, it's very important uh, to note that. Uh, the, the work was done, uh, you know, voluntarily. In other words, in, in you know, in, with, with all due respect and, you know, uh, appreciate it, uh, Will has done a lot of work that he was not required to do, but he shouldn't have to. That's the whole point. So I'm, I guess what I'm getting at here is, is with all of the work that has been done, one would think that 
this policy would be more mature than it actually is uh, because we've already laid the groundwork. I think uh, the representative from the state's office, secretary of state's office said four years. We've been doing this work for four years. So why on earth would we be uh, looking to uh, kick a can down the road called a language access report uh, or something called a voting access report? And why would we be creating a position in the, in the Secretary of State's office that does not specifically take on these roles and responsibilities, knowing that they're as important as they are and the work exists? So again, none of this specifically directed at uh, the Secretary of State's office or even any in individual legislator, but the process is not producing what it is that we need. And it is not reflective of what it is that I just heard. So again, I asked that the committee would consider doing the work that needs to get done to create a process to create something that produces results and doesn't kick the can down the road despite what anybody has done voluntarily or whether it was by statute or not. Let's get the work done. Thank you for your time, Madam Chair. Thank you for allowing me to come and testify. Thank you, and uh, uh, committee members, uh, the member from Winooski who has been involved in some of these outreach efforts um, with constituents in his community uh, had a noon meeting that he had to step out for. So I'm sure that he will take a peek at this um, part of our committee meeting that he missed. And we will certainly come back to have a committee discussion about his observations of um, the work that the Secretary of State's office has done in the past in Winooski. Um, Good day. Any other questions from committee members? Representative Higley, are you about to? Yes, you are. Go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry that I had to leave for a minute, um, but it was very important. I've been reaching out to the Secretary of State of Oregon for some time now and actually got to speak to someone. I don't really want to take the time now. It's, it's rather lengthy. As uh, a matter of fact, um, anyone from their elections division would be more than happy to testify. Uh, so anything that I say, uh, you know, going forward, if, if there's more questions around uh, what they do in regards to signature verification, uh, again, they'd be more than happy to, to check in and talk with us. So at some point, I would like to, um, I don't want to take the time now, but I, I would like to uh, initially talk about uh, what they had talked about and why they've been doing what they've been doing for 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you want to get some contact information to our committee assistant, we'll see if we can get somebody scheduled. All right, Morgan Nichols, thank you for being here today um, and would love to, to hear your thoughts on S-15. Morning, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to come before the committee today. Um, I'll be fairly brief. Um, for the record, my name is Morgan Nichols. I'm the State Director of Main Street Alliance of Vermont. Um, we are a state-based organization, a nonprofit, that works to lift up the voices um, of our over 700 small businesses who believe that when policy serves our workers, our families, and our communities, we have a more equitable um, environment where our small businesses can thrive. And uh, we, are, we come here today to show our strong support for S15. Um, we thank this committee and have done to support Vermonters throughout this pandemic and for your continued work to s serve our communities. Additionally, I want to thank the legislature, the Secretary of State's office, um, as well as our town clerk workers filled out their ballots correctly and utilized all of the avenues um, to get their ballots in on time. Please know that as we support this bill, we are also committed to continue to, this, to do this education and outreach, um, both to our members and to all eligible voters. Um, our small businesses know that when democracy is accessible to everyone, our voices and our values are more equitably represented, represented and that this is a foundation for building a society that works for everyone. Uh, we also know that like in business, our democracy works best when we focus on the end user and moving to a vote by mail system gives all voters the access that they need to make their voice heard. Uh, with the provisions and reports outlined in this bill, we are thrilled to see that steps would um, also be taken to increase access to, among groups who have been historically left out um, of the democratic process. 
Making this commitment to um, all eligible voters not only will continue to show Vermont's leadership and voter accessibility, it will also show Vermonters that you see them no matter their circumstance. Um, anecdotally, I wanna share that I have multiple um, meetings uh, per week with business owners um, from throughout the state. And as we review um, Main Street Alliance of Vermont's platform and we get to our work to support um, this bill and voter access, um, every business owner that I've spoken to shows unanimous and enthusiastic support. Um, one of our businesses, Grand Fell Meadery in St. Albans, owned and operated by Ricky and Kelly Klein, uh, worked tirelessly to provide information to their workers so that they knew how to update their address, access all candidate information, um, how to correctly fill and process their ballot to ensure that their votes were counted, um, uh, to, uh, and they wanted to ensure that they kept their workers informed on the timing to mail their ballot or how to drop it off. Um, and then they also showed them the, um, the vote by mail track your ballot um, uh, feature. Um, recently welcoming their newborn son, uh, Ricky and Kelly weren't able to, uh, to be here today. So I'm just gonna pass on the message that they, that they sent along. And this is from Ricky. At Gronfell Meadery, we are a proud member of Time to Vote and have offered paid time off to participate in elections since we founded our company. Vote by mail is the biggest opportunity we currently have to end centuries of both intentional and unintentional voter suppression. It's uninte unintentional uh, voter suppression that in many ways is the most insidious. Um, the hours that the polls are open, uh, the hour, sorry, the hours that polls are open and their location in rural areas disproportionately impacts lower wage individuals, stay at home parents, people with special needs, older Americans, new Americans, the list goes on and on. Universal vote by mail is a bold and important step to commit ourselves um, as a state to truly support democracy for all. Um, we thank you so much for your time and consideration and we urge you to support S15 uh, to making voting in Vermont accessible, safe and easy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you much for being with us today. Um, committee members, any questions for Ms. Nichols? All right. Excellent, thank you for being here. And last but not least, we have with us Christopher Miller. Um, would love to welcome you to share your um, observations on the bill. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for giving me the opportunity. Uh, and I am in the unenviable position of standing between you and lunch. So I will make my comments both brief uh, and to the point and I will submit some written testimony. Uh, so for the record, my name is Chris Miller. I lead the global advocacy work for Ben and Jerry's. Uh, and I wanna offer just a few brief comments on behalf of our support for S15. Um, you know, as you know, Vermont is called Ben and Jerry, uh, uh, Ben and Jerry's is called Vermont. It's home for 43 years and what started in a, uh, a dilapidated, dilapidated gas station about three quarters of a mile from where I stand is, is now a billion dollar business operating in almost 40 countries around the world. Um, we were incredibly pleased and, and want to offer our thanks and appreciation to legislators, the Secretary of State's office, uh, office and others for uh, how well the last election went off. Uh, I don't need to repeat all the statistics, but this was a, a, a safe, simple, secure uh, election with uh, record voter turnout. And that's incredibly uh, important. Sort of three reasons why we are supportive of S-15 broadly, but specifically this concept of, of uh, permanent vote by mail. The first is our company has been advocates for voting rights for many years. As a matter of fact, we have an exhibit up today at our Waterbury plant honoring John Lewis and his work uh, to expand voting rights in our country. Uh, we have worked uh, with Reverend Barber in North Carolina to expand voting rights, and we're actively supporting the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act uh, and the For the People Act in the United States Congress. We believe uh, any and all opportunities to make voting more accessible and more easy uh, uh, creates a stronger and more vibrant democracy. Secondly, I, I can tell you that vote by mail is in incredibly popular with our employees. Uh, we have um, more than 600 employees in the state, most of whom work at our manufacturing plants that are now operating three shifts uh, a day, uh, seven days a week. Uh, and so uh, the flexibility with which uh, the vote by mail system provided to our employees was, was incredibly well uh, um, 
uh, appreciated and, and supported. We did a, a lot of internal uh, work to ensure that our employees understood that ballots were coming, what the correct what measures were to ensure that their ballots were completed properly and returned on time. And uh, anecdotally, uh, I think as what we saw was highest ever voter turnout in the state. I think we had a higher participation rate amongst our employees than would have been the case without it. And then finally, just to note that in the context of the, the pandemic, we had to, and our team had to work exceptionally hard to keep our people safe and healthy uh, over the past year. Uh, you know, many of folks like myself uh, have had the luxury and, and safety of, you know, working from my living room, uh, while my colleagues who put uh, the, the ice cream into the tubs that shipped around the world uh, had to show up every day. And so doing everything we could uh, to minimize the exposure to themselves and to their community, so allowing them to vote from the safety and comfort of their home uh, was important from our business's point of view. Um, so making universally mail-in ballots a permanent feature in Vermont's general elections, uh, we believe will help increase access and options for voters. Um, so with that, uh, I wanna thank you. Uh, I would encourage you to support uh, S15. Uh, and I will submit uh, uh, written testimony w with a bit more points, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and spilling over into the noon hour committee. Any questions for um, Mr. Miller or any of the other folks who've been with us? Um, Director Senning, do you have anything you'd like to um, share in conclusion this morning? You are, you are observant of the unmute, that was quick. Um, I just wanted to say in quick response to uh, Chris that I forget if it was him who was our point of contact or not, but I just wanted to thank Ben and Jerry's. Um, we also worked with them through the fall in 2020 and they had a legion of uh, employees who were on call if we needed additional poll workers um, at any polling places around the state. So that was a great example of public-private partnership um, in tackling the problem last year. So I appreciate it, Chris, thanks. Thanks, Will. All right, any last questions from committee members before we break for lunch? I wanna thank all of the witnesses who have been with us this morning uh, for sharing your perspectives. Um, and we will be coming back to this Bill after the floor today and tomorrow morning with the uh, intention of being ready to go through final language tomorrow afternoon. So um, welcome you to email me if you have additional thoughts that you'd like to share with the committee and we'll get you on the committee's docket and um, have a good lunch.